Good morning. What a joy it is to be back with you again online this week. I want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all of you out there. That, that title fits. And, and what I want you to think about today is how much God loves you. You know, uh, it, it amazes me in God's Word how relevant it is, how timeless it is. You know, as I was preparing for today's lessons, as I was reading over the various readings for the day, it just jumped right out at me that God's message fits no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through. And in our gospel lesson today, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and, and they're troubled. They're worried. They're worried about what's going to happen next. What's the next step? What, where's Jesus going? He told them that he was going to leave them, and, and they were all upset. And Jesus said to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. What a perfect message for us now. And that's uh, what I want us to really think about. Don't let your heart be troubled. You have a God that loves you. A God that's bigger than any problem you'll ever have. And he loves you and he cares for you. And his mercy is there for you every day. And with that thought in mind, we're going to sing our opening hymn today. Today your mercy calls us. begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, asking God to grant us forgiveness and peace. Lord Jesus, as we confess with our lips that you are the way, the truth, and the life, we wrestle with embracing this reality in our hearts. We struggle to accept the way that you made for us through your suffering and death on the cross. We struggle to accept the way you choose to come to us in simple water, bread, and wine. We struggle to accept the weight of our own cross and suffering and believe that you are still with us. Forgive us, strengthen, renew, and lead us by your Spirit as people who have been redeemed through the resurrection. 
Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in his stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise. That among the many changes of this world's heart, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the book of Acts, uh, 6th chapter, 1 through 6, and chapter 7, 51 to 60. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we'll appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenaeus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And Stephen said, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did the fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have, who have received the law as delivered by angels, and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from the book of 1 Peter, the second chapter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that, the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
bright shining as the sun for lost this days to sing God's praise then when we first be gone please stand for the reading of the holy gospel according to john the 14th chapter verses 1 through 14 glory be to thee o lord let not your hearts be troubled believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many rooms if it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am going, you may all be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you are asking me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now join together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
grace, mercy, peace, and love be unto you from God our Father, from Jesus our Savior, and from the Holy Spirit, our source of comfort and strength. Well, as I said in the announcements, it's just so amazing how timeless God's Word is, how, how wonderful it is uh, to be able to open our Bibles and hear our Lord speak to us and comfort us and lift our spirit, especially in these dark, troubled times. So, what, so what I, as I read these lessons, I focused in on, on really one verse, one verse, and, and that's our key verse today. So let's read that verse out loud together. Uh, um, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1. What I've done here with this verse is, is, as I read that, I said, boy, that's the whole sermon right there. That, uh, that, that's all the parts. Everything that I needed to talk about is, is, is broken down into, into, these, in, into these words of Jesus, where we look at, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. So that's, that's, the, well, that's what we're going to follow. But I want to kind of lay, lay this scene. In, in John chapter 13, Jesus is, is telling the disciples, he's saying, well, I'm going to be leaving. And they're thinking, leaving? We, we finally got into Jew- We finally got to Jerusalem. We, we, we finally are, are, are there, and, 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 and you should be the king. I mean, they obviously didn't say that, but that's what they're thinking. They thought that Jesus had come down to earth to set up a, a throne and and that there would be extra thrones to sit around, and, and they could just kind of sit with Jesus, and, 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 and Judah would, would, would reign and be the, the center of everything. The world would be focused on where Jerusalem, the capital, is not only the city of power, but the place where, where the king reigned on earth. But that wasn't God's plan. Jesus came not to be an earthly king. He came, came to be the, uh, the sacrifice that would take away the sins of all mankind. And, and, they, and they were not ready to hear that. So their hearts were troubled. And, you know, and I think about what's going on with this COVID-19 and, and the, the lockdown across the whole world and the, and the economy shut down and people in the hospital and people are afraid of, of contacting this terrible pandemic and they're wondering, where is God? Because if you think that once you become a Christian that you're not going to have any more troubles because God loves you and cares for you and God is with you and then you have troubles, you wonder, is God still here? Is God not keeping his promise? But God didn't promise that Christians wouldn't get sick or Christians wouldn't suffer. God promised to be with us in the midst of our troubles. So with that kind of the prelude thought, let's jump into the outline. So we'll open up your worship folders if you misplaced them. The worship uh, folder is online. You can click on that and open that up and you know, go right back into the worship. Because I really want you to follow along as we look and see what God's word has to say about this topic of troubled hearts. The first section of your outline is let not your hearts be troubled. Letter A says, Jesus warned his followers of trouble. In John 16, 33, it says, In this world, you will have trouble. But, take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, what I always say to people is you've got to be real careful as you look at these, these words and, and, and see uh, what Jesus is, is telling you. Now, wouldn't it be terrible if the sentence ended at trouble. If, if Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. And there wasn't the second part of the verse. But, see, there's a but there. 
But, and, and it's so important, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus spoke this before he went to the cross. Jesus knew that there was trouble ahead for himself. He knew that he was going to suffer. He's going to be nailed to the cross. He's going to shed his blood. He's going to pay the price for the sins of all the world. The sins of the world would be upon him. He'd be separated from the Father. There were a lot of things he had to overcome. But he knew that he would obtain the victory. He knew that he would overcome all of these troubles that laid ahead. And see, that's, that's the real message of Easter, actually, that we understand that um, even though we live in a world where there is sin, there is pain, there is suffering, there is struggle, but Christ has won the victory. You know, yesterday was Good Friday. Yesterday was darkness. Yesterday was suffering. But Easter has come. And what happened on Easter? The tomb was empty. Jesus rose from the dead. And we who believe in him shout, He has risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's our victory. That's why we, as Jesus, can overcome the world. Yes, we all have troubles, but we have the victory in Jesus. And that's so awesome. Let's, go, let's look at letter B. Don't worry about things. Pray instead. In Philippians 4, 6, the Apostle Paul wrote, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Again, as we look at a Bible verse, you want to look at the context in which the Bible verse was uh, written. And in verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, rejoice in in the Lord always. Now think about this in your mind. How do you rejoice in the Lord when you're suffering? How do you rejoice in the Lord when you have loved ones who are suffering? How do you rejoice in the Lord when the economy is shut down and, and, and people are struggling to pay their bills and, and there's so much going on? How do you find the ability to rejoice in the Lord. Let's think about it. Where is your focus? If your focus is on all that's going on outside in the world and all the troubles and all the struggles and, and, and so much chaos and so much darkness, you get overwhelmed. But he doesn't say rejoice in the world. He says rejoice in the Lord. The Easter gospel does not get lost because of the circumstances in the world. We gotta focus on the cross. We gotta, we gotta think about the fact that Christ died, paid the price for our sins, and then there was an Easter. There's the Easter joy. You know, we get so anxious and so worried about the struggles, but we gotta realize we are victorious. We can overcome in Christ. Where is our, where's our destination? Jesus, when he ascended into heaven 40 days after Easter, there was a promise that he would return. And, and as victorious children of God, we believe the promise that Christ will return, and when he comes back, he's going to take away the troubles. He's going to take away the pain. He's going to take away the suffering. We get glorified bodies. How many of you out there are waiting for those, that day when those glorified bodies are given to you? I say, yes. Come, Lord Jesus. I am ready for that day when you totally take away the troubles from the world. But, but <laughs> until he comes... We live in Christ. We find strength in him. 
We can overcome the troubles because we focus not on the troubles, but we focus on our risen Savior. We focus in his victory. We focus on his promises. And so what we need to do is learn to pray to our Lord to help carry those troubles for us. And that's really letter C, so let's move into there. God has a way of making things work out. In Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What we've got to realize here is that God is the one who gets things done. That's the bottom line. And, and, and that's, as, as we go about our day, as we go about our, our daily task, of, we look at our challenges, we see what's ahead, rather than getting overwhelmed and, and worried and concerned, we turn to the Lord. He is the one that makes things work out. He is the source of strength. And all things good come from him. And who does he give them to? Those who have been called according to his purpose. We are his children. We don't earn God's love. We don't earn God's grace. In our special music, we heard amazing grace. <laughs> How awesome is that? How amazing it is that God loves us so much that he's with us in the midst of our troubles. He's there to help carry the load. He's there to work good through our life, throughout our life, giving us the assurance that the destination is secure in Christ, that we don't earn that love. It's freely given, unconditionally provided by God himself. Well, that takes us to the second point of the outline, where Jesus says, believe in God. Believe in God. So the question is, who is this God that Jesus wants us to believe in? Well, if we look in our catechism, is which I did, I thought, we got three very important characteristics of God, and those would be the points of the outline. If we look at letter A, our God is all-powerful, which means omnipotent. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, I, I want to lay the context of what Jesus was saying here. In Matthew 19, a, a rich young man uh, comes up to Jesus and he says, Teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, I tell you, it is easier for a camel. Well, I don't want to get to that point yet. Jesus basically explains to the man, well, sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the young rich man said, oh, he just walked away because his riches were, were so important to him that, that he didn't want to let go of that. And once he was gone, the disciples were thinking, well, who could be saved? And then in verse 24, Jesus, I tell you, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And why did Jesus say this? Well, the biggest animal that the disciples had ever seen was a camel. And the smallest opening that the disciples had ever seen was the eye of a needle. So he said, well, it's easier for this big giant camel to go through this needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And the disciples were so concerned, and, and they said, well, don't be concerned. With God, everything is, is possible. Even though it looks impossible, even though you can't imagine a camel going through the eye of a needle, with God, it's possible. And the point is, every one of us are sinners. And it's impossible for us to enter into the kingdom of God, which is a pure, holy, sinless place, unless God's going to work a miracle. And that's the whole point. 
If God doesn't work a miracle in your life, if he doesn't transform you from being a sinner into a saint, there's no way you're going to enter into glory. And this is the whole point of our, of our whole life and our whole thinking, that God desires to work miracles in the lives of his people. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants to be with you. He wants to help you to overcome your life's challenges. All right, so let's think about this, that our God is omnipotent. He works those miracles. He transforms sinners into saints. So if we have a God that's that powerful and so wonderful, isn't he bigger than COVID-19? Isn't he bigger than any challenge you have in your life? Of course he is. He's a God that loves you. I mean, the omnipotent God created the heavens, the earth. He put the stars in the sky and the planets in the orbit, and he keeps everything moving where it needs to be. He certainly can handle our world. He's certainly there for us today. No problem is too big. Think about Jesus when he was here on earth. The blind cried out to him as in our portals of prayer this week where the, the, the blind man cries out to Jesus, Lord, son of David, heal me. And he restored his sight. He healed the lame. He even raised the dead. And he certainly has forgiven sinners like us and made us into saints. Let's look at letter B. Our God is all-knowing. That's omniscient. In Psalm 139, verses 2 to 3, it says, You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Our God is so awesome. He's sitting there in heaven, and he knows every detail of every person's life. He knows your hurts. He knows your troubles. He knows the situation you're in. And he has a solution for your life. You know, and, 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 that, and that's the point, that God loves us. Think about this. If God sent his son to die on the cross, to be nailed there, to suffer your sin, the price for your sin, the wages sin of death, and he goes to the cross and he, he says, I'll pay the price because I love every one of you. Well, if God loved you enough to die for you, he certainly loves you enough to be with you each day, to take care of you, to help you get through your troubles, to help you go through your struggles. How wonderful it is to have a God that cares about every detail of our life. Look at letter C. Our God is everywhere, omnipresent. In Matthew 28, 20, he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the, of the age. You know, this, this, this is really good news, that God is with you. I, I always say, as a baptized child of God, you are never alone. He's always there for you to lean on. He's always there to lift you up, to encourage you, to guide you, to direct you in your life so that you won't uh, fall astray. He loves you and will be there for you. And that takes us to the third section where Jesus says, believe also in me. So the question here is, well, who is Jesus? Well, look at letter A. Jesus is God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the fundamental, essential truth of the Bible. Jesus is God, the second person of the Godhead. We believe in a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all co-equal. second person of the Godhead became man, but never stopped being God. So in other words, this is the miracle of, of, of the whole 
incarnation of Christ, where the second person of the Godhead, who always was God, is going to become a man. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. God said, I will pay the price. God cannot die because he's eternal. So he had to become man. So the second person of the Godhead miraculously becomes human by through the womb of a virgin and becomes man. That's what we confessed in the Apostles' Creed. So now, once Jesus was born through the womb of the virgin, he's 100% man. Simultaneously, 100% God. I always say that eternal truth is way bigger than, than will fit in our finite brain. The infinite God is in the womb of a virgin, is born as a baby, becoming human, but still simultaneously being God. We cannot understand that, but we accept it by faith. By faith, we believe God loved us enough to work through that miraculous process so that he could be our savior, he could be the lamb that would pay the price for the sins of the world, and by faith, we believe it. Look at letter B. If you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now as you look at this verse and you think about it, the key word here is to believe. To believe in him. Now that's not head knowledge. Satan believes Jesus is God. And Satan's going to spend all eternity in hell. So his believing that Jesus is the Son of God and truly God himself is not saving faith. The saving faith doesn't happen here. Saving faith happens here. We need to love God. We need to believe that he loves us. We need to believe that he went to the cross for us. We need to believe that his innocent, precious blood set on the cross was worthy and precious enough to pay for the price of the world and most importantly, to pay the price for the sins of my sin. So with heart knowledge, we love Jesus. And with heart knowledge, we receive his love for us through a saving faith that clings to the knowledge that Jesus is our Savior and through his sacrifice, our sins have been paid for. And that calms our troubled heart. That takes us to the last point of the outline, letter C. And, and letter C says, nothing can separate us from God's love. In Romans 8, 3, and 8, 8, 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Now, what's really important to this, uh, as you're reading this, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And, and now what, he, what he's doing here. He's basically saying, guys, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have hardship, and you're going to have persecution, and you're going to have famine, and you're going to have nakedness, and you're going to have danger of sword. But don't let any of that separate you from God's love. And, 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 and that's for us, too. We're going to have trouble. We're going to have sickness. We're going to have struggles. We're going to have hurts. But don't let that separate you from the love of God. Let that love of God be your source of strength. Let that love of God give you the assurance that you can get through whatever your trouble is. Because God is with you. He chose each and every one of us to be in his family. He adopted us through the water of baptism. He, he called us into his family. 
and he will be with us and finally bring us into glory because he loves us today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, calm your troubled hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, we no normally have our offering, and like I said last week, you can't put your offering in an offering plate, so please put your offering in the offering envelope, place that envelope in a regular mailing envelope, address it to the church and send it, and that'll be a wonderful support for the ministry for uh, God's kingdom. Well, let's uh, continue now with our prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, we thank and praise you for the precious gift of your eternal word. Thank you for uniting us with yourself in word and sacrament. We ask that you would continue to provide all that we need for this life and the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving Savior, thank you that you are the eternal incarnate word. Thank you being the way and the truth and the life. Teach us to follow your way, to proclaim your truth, and to live your life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Blessed Holy Spirit, thank you for living in us. We ask that you would preserve us in the one true faith. Give us the mind of Christ as Holy Scripture promises, so that we may all come to full unity in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy God, your power brought all things into being, and still you preserve what you have made. Bless our President, the Congress of the United States, our Governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants, so that they may honor you and your purpose, establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue, and protecting all life. Give wisdom and moderation to them and their leadership for the well-being of the nation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O merciful Father, you have compassion upon the sick and those in need and have promised not to ignore them in their afflictions. Turn back the pandemic across the globe and give us relief. Bless the sick with healing, those who suffer with strength and patience, and the dying with peace. Hear us on behalf of those who have requ requested our prayers. Claire Alaska, Faye Adams, Ed Belint, Susan Barris, Lana Clark, Mary Clausen, Bonnie Cooper, Ron Jankowski, Bill DeVries, Carol Dismeyer, Ken Dorman, Gert Dunlop, Lauren Vernesh, Brian Fico, Shirley Ford, Michael Hampton, Ellen Heafy, Tom Hetrick, Joyce Hitch, Mildred Holman, Kathy Iverson, Pat Jennings, Anito Garbo, El Kanak, Mary Lassard, Jody Logman, Eva Martin, Evelyn Meyer, Brand Nye, Marge Rosencotter, Sandra Schmidt, Hazel Schofester, Ernestine Schultz, Betty Sentevenek, Delbert, Delbert Schaefer, Mary Smackle, Janie Spence, Luann Stone, Don Van Meter, Joyce Walecki, Richard Zimdahl, Ken Zimmer, and Eleanor Zimney. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, you have established a home and bless those who show us your love. Bless all mothers and the children in their care. Bless all families to make their home places of blessing and love, for your word is spoken. Forgiveness reigns and love is displayed. Give us good examples to inspire youth to all that is good and pure and to seek after these things. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us wisdom of faith that through the Spirit 
we might know your Son to be the way, the truth, and the life. Bless all those who teach and all who learn, that the goal of our knowledge may be to know Christ and to make him known. Do not let your word be bound, but let it have free course among us. Preserve those in isolation from idleness, and instead let our minds be renewed in scripture and prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, you are not aloof from the needs of this body and life, and you have called us to love our neighbor in need and give aid to the poor. Give us courage and faith that we may not fear sharing the resources you have supplied with those who live in want, especially the widow, the orphan, the unemployed. Let love be perfected among us to drive out selfish fears. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Eternal Father of an eternal mercy, you have raised up witnesses in every age and blessed us with those who endured suffering and even death and faithfulness to Christ. We give you thanks for these faithful saints and martyrs, and we pray you to make us strong when we face the day of test, that at length we may be brought with them in the, into the joy of your presence and the glory of everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Continue now by singing praise to the Lord Almighty.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Next week, we'll be talking about making choices. Life is all about choices. We could choose to go back to normal, or we can choose to go forward to the better life that God has made. So I invite you to come back next week online, or if we open the doors, whatever happens. Uh, but be with us, join us, and listen to the message of hope that God gives us. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs>